Okay, hello everyone and welcome back to our channel, Pivot to Inclusion. Once again, we are here to talk diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the topic of today is one near and dear to my heart. It's a stereotype that I have faced personally, and I think there is value in deconstructing it and sharing information to help others understand it. The angry black woman. We're going to talk about that today. And with me, I have my business partner, Dr. Scott Herbst. And joining us, we have a very special guest, someone near and dear to my heart, one of my forever friends, Miss Maya Akai. Maya and I grew up in the same area. We have a lot of parallel lived experiences through the schools we went to. We even went off to the same college together. So Maya, can you please let folks know a little bit about who you are and, and share, because I couldn't do your accolades justice. <laughs> Just, just share a I always, few of them. I always say I feel like I've lived many lives in just this one, which is interesting. Um, <laughs> seriously, I wear many hats. Um, I'm one to, I work in mental health. I am a crisis intervention specialist in the emergency department. I have a master's in clinical counseling. And so that's kind of my mental health field. I've been in for 20 years, but I've also worked in post-secondary education with it, social services. So I've really worked with like a lot of different populations from, you know, gender, age, social economic status, education, you name it. I've really got to have a lot of rich experiences with people working in the mental health field. That's the, then I have the other side of me, which is broadcasting. Yes. Um, so that was my initial undergrad degree at the University of Iowa. I did communication studies. So um, I worked in radio, actually sports talk. Um, I was on 670 to score for a bit, did the weekend overnights. Wow. Um, and from there, it just kind of got in. Then I went to 1690 WVON and then had a chance to let her over and do more of a traditional talk show that wasn't sports based. And that to me really drew it in because it allowed me to have a lot of salient conversations with people. Um, yes. Because at that time, 1690 is more of an urban station. So I got to really have salient conversations respectfully with the black community and others that would tune in and challenge and grow. And that part to me was amazing because so many of the things that I had experienced others had. And then there was also the other side of that coin is he, people had different experiences, which gets into the whole thing about often with stereotypes, there's this ideal of homogeny, that people are the same. Okay. You may be the same in what you share, let's say in regards to culture, you know, you yeah. share a culture, you may share a racial designation, something of that nature. But what people don't understand is when you drill deep into people, individual experiences make you who you are. And the minute you're stereotyped, it takes away your autonomy. Oh, so there we go. I really dug, go. dug deep into that show. So now um, I actually do a podcast called Maya, My Ambition, Your Ambition, where we talk about, you know, getting to the best version of yourself, which means challenging, you know, mm -hmm. all the things that have held you back, you know, things that you have bought into. One of the things I always say consistently within my podcast is you have to do away with thinking things like fake it till you make it. Because if you mm -hmm. fake it till you make it, it means you are not embracing who you are in the moment. And being present is so important if you're ever going to grow and change. There we go. Maya, okay, let's get into this. See, now this is, you're, you're lighting me up right now. <laughs> okay, you know I could talk about this all day long. I know, I know. You know yeah. I could. We okay, have. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's get into it. Maya, this angry Black woman and these stereotypes, because the angry Black woman actually is just one. I mean, when you think about some of the roles and stereotypes and tropes attached to us as Black women, I can remember the sapphire, mm -hmm. the, the sexual vixen. I know the mammy, mm -hmm. the caretaker. Yes. But what makes the angry Black woman, because all of them are damaging, but I think with sapphire, we're going to that's limited to the younger woman. The mammy, we kind of look at the mammy as an older woman, but this angry black woman, I think most black women living in the United States can relate to this one or relate to the experiences of trying to avoid having the stereotype attached to you. It is. And to me, it kind of has a counterbalance with the angry black woman and the independent woman. Um, the strong black woman, whereas, you know, you you can conquer anything. There is no weakness for you. Um, those two things go very closely hand in hand. You talk about, I think, the modern idea of stereotypes. 
I do agree with you with the sapphires tend to be younger. And if you turn on certain artists, I think they fall right into that yes. designation of seeing it that way. Um, the Mammy part was probably far more we talk about more of the turn of the century. Gone with the Wind was a huge part of that. Um, that idea, uh, you know, yes. with Hattie McDaniels. So to me, I don't think you see as much as that. Now it's more of the caretaker piece. Um, so you're right. But with the angry black woman, what's interesting, and you and I have talked about this, I said, you know, part of what is often difficult is having people understand that this stereotype runs a ribbon through every racial group, but it's a matter of perception. So when black women show passion or be very direct in their thoughts, mm. you're angry. Even if you have a right to be angry, you're still angry. You know what That's I mean? That's right. Um, That's right. On the flip side, because I'm half Latino, you get the fiery Latino passionate kind of thing. You know, it's not looked at negatively. It's like, oh, you're fiery. Um, what's interesting and in often terms when you look, um, Asian women are often looked at being docile, which they hate because many are not that way at all. So if they speak up, it's, you know, and this also kind of aligns a little bit with, with white females, you're finding your voice. You're finding your strength. You're stepping out. Yes. You see the you see the difference. There is a difference. In those narratives for each group of women. There, so there is, and I will tell you where, where it relates to emotion. And I'm curious to know how this has impacted you. But what I learned to do early on, and this is incredibly sad, but I learned to mute myself, mute my emotions in certain situations because I learned it wasn't safe for me to express emotions because they would more often than not be uh, misinterpreted. No, and that, yeah, yeah, I agree that, with that misinterpretation would oftentimes result in some sort of punitive consequence for me. Yes, you're right. I, I, I agree with that. It was very much, um, I spent a good portion of childhood, adolescence, even young adulthood muting a lot of, of, of my fiery passionateness, so to speak. Yes. Um, I was an outspoken child from day one. So I already had one story <laughs> going against me. You I, were, Maya. I was I always, I was the girl who was arguing with the ref on the basketball. Yeah, like, yes, you, you did. Like, are you kidding me? That's insane. <laughs> I mean, so I, I came into this world, like, you know, with something to say, so to yes, speak. Yes, you did, yes. Um, and it was interesting because I did know at times, sometimes I would just fall back and not say something. But... I realized there was a small caveat. This is what's interesting. And even a little bit of privilege. I can't tell you so much that I got the label of being an angry black woman, but this is why. People saw, oh, you're very articulate and you're educated. <laughs> you're different. Yes. So hence, yes. I didn't fall into a stereotype of what people assumed that black people were like, so to yes. speak. So that label didn't get strongly attached to me, but more of the independent you're strong, you know, you can handle anything, which was a detriment because then I thought I could yes. and would suffer in silence because I was too afraid to lean into somebody else and to ask for help because guess what? That's not what I'm supposed to do. That absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. And then Scott, it, it looked like you had something to say. There were like five different times I could have <clears throat> asked a question. What <clears throat> I'm thinking about now, what I'm interested in, is um, where my mind was just wandering was actually towards like uh, the recent presidential debate, not presidential, vice presidential debate, right? Mm -hmm. uh, between Kamala Harris and um, Mike Pence, where, um, you know, I saw a lot of like, I was on edge for stereotype, right? And for my, I only saw, I saw like 20 minutes of it, but in that 20 minutes, it looked like he was really just like egregiously taking advantage of, you know, the moderator would be like, okay, that's your time. And he would just keep talking. And she'd say, uh, you know, vice president, and he'd just keep talking. And, um, <clears throat> and it looked to me like, I don't know. I was really impressed with how she handled it in terms of just like, I would, I would say she was so centered, right? Like she, how she occurred to me was just centered, unflappable. Um, and I'm, I'm curious. So I'm curious, like that's where my wine mind watered. And I'm curious what you two guys saw there 
uh, given because like I, I I understand the stereotype of the angry black woman like it's just in the culture, um, and uh, like probably if you did like a fill in the blank angry blank woman like I'd write black in there you know, um, and uh, but so I have this kind of like you know this like middle aged white guy understanding of it right. Oh. Um, and I'm curious, but no real experience, like walking into a room and having to manage myself so people don't see me like I'm an angry black woman, mm -hmm. right? And so I'm curious, uh, I'm assuming you both watch the debate. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't want to interrupt the conversation now, but I would like to touch on that, like the perspective of that, you know, yeah. from someone who's kind of like lived inside the skin of a black woman and what you saw there that I might be missing, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Can I tackle this one first, Maya? You sure can. Okay. From my lens, and this is to me, regardless of whether or not you're Democrat or Republican, what I saw Kamala Harris do on that stage was masterful. What I saw was a woman engaging in mental acrobatics because there were several points. And I saw it in her face. I saw it in her body language where she wanted to smack him across the screen, but didn't. You know what she did? And I knew it. I recognized it because I've had to learn to do it. She kept that smile on her face. She stayed polite. She watched her demeanor because the entire country is watching. And she knows if she is perceived as overly emotional as angry she won't get they won't people won't vote for her so what I saw I, I I saw her calm and collected I agree but I saw I recognized every moment where she was pissed and what I got present to especially after watching it and engaging with social media that many white folks didn't, they, they saw calm, but they didn't recognize the pieces where she was showing some incredible restraint. And when, when, when she said that classic, that classic phrase, she said, I'm speaking. And what a powerful representation that was, I think for all women, for all women. However, it meant something real deep to me because how often have I sat in meetings? Have I been engaged in conversations? And the white male interrupts, overspeaks, and silences me. So it was, it, was a, it was a powerful moment. And I think regardless of political party, what Kamala Harris demonstrated to me was what it really takes to be a Black woman in the United States as a professional. What, I'm curious to know your thoughts, Maya. You know, you hit the nail on the head with that. It was clear that I could tell that she was using restraints, but she gave <laughs> just enough body language to let you know. She did it. Like, really? Like, to let you know that <laughs> made a mental check to what he had said. Um, I loved, I liked it when she said, I'm speaking, because you know what, I'm I've done speaking. that. Because that's one thing I'm not shy, and I've done that before, like I wasn't done talking yet. So I, have, oh, yes. so I have no problem with that. I have no problem stopping people like dead in their tracks. If you know what, Maya? I, lo <laughs> I love that in you. Because my takeaway from that was what I will do is say, can I please speak? Can I finish? Never again. That has been X'd out of my vocabulary. In 2020, Nasia says, I'm speaking. And that's, you know, and I think you said for a lot of women, they could identify with that regardless to what type of woman that it was but it was interesting because there were some people that i would watch read their facebook post and they're like oh my god she's the smirk in her face and she's being so snarky i was like really <laughs> okay yeah um she's not gonna have a flat affect and not show some range of emotion but she did it to me in a very tasteful way um and you're right she knew that she was going to be judged not just as you know this is going to be your vice president who we know vice presidents now carry far more responsibility in the scope of their in their job than they ever have, let's say in the last 20 or 30 years. The most recent VPs have really done a lot of strong work. So 
you look at this person, you know, and you think about that's one of the same things that Hillary Clinton struggled with was not wanting to show that emotion because as women, here's, here's a general kind of, you know, a label we get. They're so emotional. We're such emotional creatures, you know? So hence, you know, and what's anger? Probably the easiest emotion, obviously, to elicit from yourself. So, you know, I understood that she had to have the composure, but I, I, I totally liken to the fact that she's an attorney. So she knows how to have verbal volleyball with people. She knows how not to play her hand too hard. You know, she can have a poker face because she comes from, you know, that field where you have to be able to do that and have restraint, even if you don't agree with what's happening on the opposite side of the courtroom. So in that part, she definitely had training on how to be masterful when she was at that podium. Yes. And she did well at it. So, yes, she did well. She did well. It's, It's interesting. You know, as you speak, I think about. I can go back to my childhood, but I think about some of the mentors that I have had in my adult life, black women, older black women who taught me for lack of a better term, how to play this game because it does become a game when your livelihood is attached to how you have to show up in the world. So I remember it was, I was uh, on faculty at Chicago State And there was a white professor there, white female professor, who was giving me the flux about something. And I had one of the older black women, she pulled me aside and she said- What what does that mean, the flux? Just, (laughs) she was giving me a hard Hard, time, Hard time, yeah. Okay, got it, okay. (laughs) That's what I thought, I just wanted to check in. Break out your urban dictionary, you might get a little (laughs) here and there, a little bit here and there. So that's, she was giving me the flux, giving me a hard time. And one of the older black women there had pulled me aside. And she said, Nasia, I want you to, I I want you to go in her office and I do not want you, I don't want you to lay a hand on her, but she said, I want you to kick her ass. And I, I, I didn't understand, I said, Dr. What, what do you mean? She said, listen, don't you touch her. <laughs> but I want you to get her in that office and I want you to kick her ass. Well, guess what? Nasia learned how to kick somebody's ass without putting my hand on them. So I have appreciated in my life the Black women who have really been there and taught me how to toe the line. Because Scott, you may not know this, but it's not easy for us. It's not easy for us to show up as Black women in this world. And a lot of us, what do we do, Maya? We depend on each other. Mm -hmm. You know, Scott, you do know my work. I do a lot of mentoring of younger professionals. And it's really rooted in that, making sure that I give people the tools they need to get through this because I didn't always have them and I suffered. So Maya, Maya, I wanna ask you, who helped you along the way? Because growing up in Joliet, you know, it was very segregated. I, I came from an all black community and was educated in an all white environment and it was incredibly traumatizing and difficult. Um, And I didn't really get the tools that I needed until I was an adult. I know your experience was a little bit different. You know, it was different in the sense, so like you said, went to private school, um, lived in the black community for a certain amount of time. And then we ended up moving Mm -hmm. um, midway through um, my junior high years um, into, uh, at the time was becoming a mixed area, but it was still a small group of black families that were there. But for me, it was my mother and my grandmother were so integral you know, obviously, and being good role models and, you know, telling me to have a voice and to speak up for myself. Um, like I said, I ne- I've never not had a voice. Um, right. So, so it was like, true. so it was more about understanding how to use it properly in situations you don't engage in everything. And they were really good about that and, and having that insight. But I also had within my family, almost everybody pretty much had gone through private school. So we went to a school where like the family was known. <laughs> so yes. it wasn't, so it wasn't so foreign. So I knew some of the families I had known for years just because some of their siblings had gone to school with some of my aunts and uncles and things like that. Yes. So I have to say that within initially my Catholic school, I cannot say that I really ever felt like an outsider. I, I can't, I can't say I had that experience. No, I can tell you, I remember some of the incidents of racism. I remember things that happened, but it wasn't across the board 
something that happened frequently. And one of the things I thought was interesting is I remember like the first day of kindergarten is I'm all like, you know, excited about going to school. My mom's having a breakdown. I'm like, hey, I'll see you at noon, you know? And she's like having this breakdown about dropping me off at school. She's like, you know, I want to tell you something. Everyone may not like you and it's okay. And I was like, what? <laughs> you know, that made more sense to me as I got older. Yes. Um, yes. Everyone may not understand you. Um, and that part was true. And I would have to say that though I felt accepted, I clearly was still aware of difference, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. So to feel included in something, but yet to know that you're still different was very much a, a part of my reality. It really yes. was. Um, I was still aware that I was the black girl that went to school there. Yes. Um, that became really aware, especially when we maybe would, um, cause I also was in cheerleading. So when we would go to other schools um, and there'd be like no other minorities, it was so clear to me that I was a different one. And I even had gotten a story from another individual who had went to another Catholic school who was a cheerleader and they were going to a Catholic school in one of the more rural areas. And she was not allowed to go to the competition because they wouldn't allow her to go at the other yes. school. So mind you, this, this is a private school, mind you. Yes. So the fact that this, and it's Catholic. So the fact that this was allowed to happen still blows my mind. Um, I don't know where her parents would have been with that that they allowed it to happen because I know who would have shown up at the door of my school yes. had that happened. My mother would have never let that happen. She would have been like, oh, no, you don't. And she would have called them out on it. So it was always about taking a stand, having a voice, but understanding everything isn't worth the fight. And I really got that from my mother and my grandmother because they knew I was an outspoken. They knew I was outspoken yes. from day one. So they taught me how to take that and to use that as a tool opposed to it becoming something that was a detriment to me. Absolutely. You were indeed blessed and very fortunate to have that that support and mentorship r- close to home mm-hmm. in your mother and your grandmother. I remember uh, in elementary school, again, I was an athlete, and I remember um, not being able, because I was the only little Black girl in my class from first grade to eighth grade, And when it came time for us to play at certain schools, we couldn't go because I was on the team. Interesting. They were, and I can, I mean, I don't want to mention the towns or maybe I should, but there are a couple surrounding towns Mm -hmm. in surrounding Joliet, if you can remember that at the time were incredibly segregated Mm -hmm. and you can say it Plainfield, Plainfield. Shanahan, Wilmington, yes, yes. Uh, yes. Wilmington, all yes. those little, yes. little towns mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It was dangerous for for me to 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 go play. So I remember the team being mad at me, like we can't go because of her. And really, the the school they were attempting to keep people safe. Um, but again, that's incredibly traumatizing because what happens is my black skin becomes what the problem. That's, that's interesting. Cause I remember, um, there was no secret about playing field. Yes. There wasn't, I mean, granted, I think they've grown in leaps and bounds since the time that I was in high school, mm-hmm. but I remember dropping off a friend that we had done something at school and she lived in Plainfield, and I gave her a ride home. It was me and my cousin. And I had to stop and get gas. And I go into the gas station, pump the gas. And it was probably like about seven o'clock at night. And the lady's I'm paying, this lady behind the counter, she goes, um, sweetie, you're going home, right? And I was like, yeah, she goes, you make sure you drive out and you don't stop anywhere else. You go home. And I, me and my cousin didn't get it initially. Yeah. It took a minute before we realized what she was telling us is that it wasn't safe. And That's I was right. like, and that kind of blows my mind to think that that was something that was an issue to that degree that two young girls wouldn't be safe driving home. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let me, let me share this. And this definitely ties into this angry black woman or who, who our society views or believes the black woman is, you know, I was uh, the, the victim of a very public crime and I don't know if either of you have ever heard of bystander syndrome, Mm -hmm. but I was a victim of a very public assault, brutal. And there were people who were around, but nobody helped. Nobody helped me. And I always wonder, had I had blonde hair and blue eyes, given what was happening, if somebody would have jumped in. And when I say nobody help, I'm telling you hard legs was around. Hard legs meaning men. They were around and nobody 
nobody jumped in. And I reflecting back on it, when when black women are in harm's way, you know, whether it's us being assaulted in public or us going to the doctor and being kind of pushed away or pushed aside, the perception always seems to be, yeah, they can handle it. But the, it's, it's never along the lines of, and this goes back to what you said earlier, Maya, Maya we need to help. There is something around the conditioning in this country that moves in the direction of Black women don't get helped. That's very true. That that's and that's been a long standing stereotype that to me, I think it comes very strongly rooted starting all the way back in slavery mm -hmm. when, you know, black women, you know, we obviously we worked because obviously we were property. But even once you had the ending of slavery in 1865, um, black women were actually able to secure employment, take care of their families. To a certain degree, we stepped into the role of being the man, the head of the household, not by choice, but by necessity, so to speak. And yeah. then you also got through Jim Crow, you got vagrant laws, which this is where mass incarceration started for black men, where if you couldn't find a job, you could then be incarcerated. Well, if you're a black man in like, you know, <laughs> 18, you know, 95, you're not finding work was difficult. And this became um, free labor. Many companies have a history being tied to using the labor of black men when they were incarcerated. So black women ended up carrying that, that responsibility of being the head of the household. And then, and by the way, what came with that is, oh, and now you are so very emasculating to men. <laughs> well, yes. the, the issue turns out to be is when you are surviving, by the way, that was a whole process of, of surviving versus thriving. Yes. By necessity, we had to be those strong people so that our families could survive. And that concept has traveled with us, but yes, the problem is it's not exactly the same anymore. And it has a, ne it has a negative connotation tied to it that, oh, black women, they can handle it. They're yeah. not weak. They're, they're, they're gonna be okay. Um, they can do it. And I'll tell you this, on the flip side, we often buy into it and don't want to show weakness. Oh, there we go. We do. I mean, I'm, we not, go. I'm not gonna say innocent of not sometimes playing into the role. We don't want to come across as being weak. That yes. we need to be saved. Um, yes. it's, it's rare you're ever gonna see the word damsel in distress behind some black woman's name. That's <laughs> it's, it's rare. It's rare. It's rare. And when you do see people like that, people always think that's very uncharacteristic. When oh my God, she seems so demure and. <laughs> So, so soft and fragile. Those are words that generally do not get attached to when you describe black women. Like when you talked about fill in the blank, Scott, about angry blank woman, and you said you would fill in black. But what's interesting, you could say angry scorned woman. You don't even have to, you don't even have to necessarily insert race, but we are so indoctrinating into this concept and the stereotype that we assumed that that's the appropriate word to fill in the blank. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that, that implicit association, absolutely, absolutely. You know, I, wanna, I want to talk a little bit about, because Scott and I are doing a lot of work with organizations and really helping to educate and help organizations navigate policy and procedure around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And let's talk a little bit about how this stereotype shows up in the workplace. How, how does it get manifested? What happens? What are some potentials for trauma? I can reflect on my own experience in the workplace. Um, I would remain quiet when I should have spoken up. Um, I would feel torn because I would go in certain work situations feeling or just knowing I couldn't be, be myself. And the thing with it is everything in my, my personal culture supported that. It's as a black woman, as a black person probably, but particularly as a black woman, I believe we've come to accept the workplace and who you are are just not in sync. You cannot show up to work authentically. You know, I had a, a young lady several months ago who attended one of my trainings and I had learned this new term, you know, show up as your authentic self. And she said, well, now see, I'm always my authentic self at work. 
And not, not six months after we did that, she did show up as her authentic self and she was fired from her position. So let's talk about how this impacts workplace culture and how it impacts everybody, but particularly Black women in the workplace. You know, again, it's that stereotype of being angry kind of precedes you. Um, mm -hmm. So if you, even if you're absolutely right in the situation and the position you're taking, if you have a right to be upset or angry or disgruntled, um, you have to be careful how you choose to approach it because people, even if a situation, I'll, I'll tell you something that actually happened to me and it blew my mind, seriously. Mm -hmm. I had a situation where I was working for a school, not to be named, that's no longer open. And I had complained about, you know, you're bringing people into this school that we know are not going to be successful at this. You know, mm -hmm. um, and they're taking these loans out, they're going into debt, and then you're collecting money. It was, at the end of the day, it was like, I was honest about you, you couldn't go after these people. And we sat down and we talked about this, the president of the school in her office. I'm sitting here, she's across at her desk. We, we're talking about there's a good, at least 25 feet, if not more between us and talking and her door is open. Mm. So we then up having a meeting with HR because of some complaints that I had made that I felt there were some things that weren't ethical. And in this meeting, and by the way, the girl who was over HR actually went to high school with her, which I thought was interesting. In this meeting, the president of the company said, and then she got aggressive and hostile with me and I felt afraid. Cool. And can I tell you, I was so blown away. Yes. I mean, cause it was a lie. I mean, from top to <laughs> yes. bottom. Like the door was open, people could hear the conversation. I never got out my seat. And I was so taken aback that she lied like that. I looked at her, I said, that's absolutely not true. I said, your door was open and I was sitting in this chair. I said, I never came anywhere near you. I said, why would you say something like that? I'm like, that's, <laughs> I'm like, that's an assassination of my character. Um, but either way, they actually bought what she said and I was terminated. Wow, Maya. And it blew my mind because I was like, this woman, I mean, when I say she lied, and the thing is, when I walked out of the office, her secretary was sitting there and she looked at me, but no one was gonna speak up and say, that's not, wow. that's not true, she's lying. Maya, let because, me, let me. But think about that, how easy it was for them to assume that what she was saying was true at face value. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I have a story to share too, but let me ask you this, is it possible is it possible that she really believed you were threatening her? Because I've, I've encountered that, that through the lens of a white person. Remember too, you know, we are accustomed to crossing environments and switching and shifting. But if you're a white person and you don't come into contact with black people and what you are seeing black people as is what you see on TV, your lens is these are scary, frightening people who are aggressive and could hurt me. So you may have sat up in your seat and to her well, that well, she lunged at me. I'll tell you this. So she actually, I was at a different school and asked me to come there and work for her. So it wasn't like she didn't know me. Um, but I'll tell you what the issue was. I met her where she was at mentally and emotionally and walked right past her. Mm -hmm. That was the issue. Mm -hmm. um, I am one to be known to be able to really cut close with my words, <laughs> seriously. Oh, yes, and the I thing know. is, the thing is, I put her in her place and she struggled with that. I yeah. already knew because here comes that position of power. See, I'm also that person that um, I can get another job. But what you won't do is disrespect me. What you yeah. won't do is I'm not going to sit here and say what you're doing to these people are okay because I know that it's wrong. Yeah. And this is why the school is not being successful. And by the way, that's exactly why the school got shut down. So my thing was, I was trying to like, you were arguing with me about numbers and I'm like, look, there is nothing. This is what the truth is. You're bringing in people that can't be successful. I said, but you know this and you've done this, 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 and this. And they had done things and tried to say that I did it. And I was like, I wasn't even here when that was arranged yet. So how did I have a part of that? I mean, it was just like a lot of really unethical stuff that got called to the table, but she felt it was easy just to, to lie. But the thing that I thought was interesting is I'm sure she felt absolutely small. Yes. Because I didn't back down on my conviction of where I was at with it. I didn't. Um, I wasn't that person who didn't know how to articulate herself. Um, that, that's, I wasn't that person. So did she probably feel threatened to a degree? Absolutely. But it was based on my words, not on my actions. Yes. Yes. No. In that sense, yes. 
I've, I have been there. I have been there. And Scott, again, you look like you want to say something. Well, I was just thinking about, um, you know, well, people watching may not know, but Nasia, you know, I'm kind of obsessed with integrity, right? And um, there's not the, um, here, here's what's interesting to me is that, um, like, I don't think it's unusual that she would attack you, Maya. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and I'm calling that an attack, like a lie, right? Right. Um, it's not unusual that she would attack you because you were calling her out on integrity, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, if you're running a business and probably you don't hold yourself out to as I'm here to prey on students and really get their money when I know they're going to fail out and then have a whole bunch of debt, right? Mm -hmm. um, and one thing people do is when when I lack integrity, when people lack integrity, I think it's a pretty common thing is that we get mean, you know, and, uh, and it starts to look as though the world is attacking us. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, what, what's interesting. So I, I don't think it's like unusual that if lying was going to be her thing, a way to get out of trouble that she would do it. What, um, what is interesting to me is, uh, that probably it's a lot easier to lie and say like, oh, I was threatened by, you know, like Central Park Karen, right? Who's <laughs> like, I'm going to call the police and I'm going to tell them you're attacking me and and they're going to come here and they're going to arrest you, right? And that being like kind of a known strategy, like oh, I can just, you know, you can just tell people the black person's threatening me and, uh, you know, the police will come get them. That's a um, thing. Yeah, no, I know it's a thing. Like <laughs> the that woman in Central Park was like, well, like said it out loud, you know. Like, yes. hey, this is how it works, right? Um, that's what I was thinking. I did, I did kind of have a question about it. Um, I don't know. That, that's what I was thinking. Okay. Um, yeah. What do you think? Hey, I, I've lived it, and, and I know I have shared with you, Scott, this happened to me in the past six months. <clears throat> the place, um, a place of employment that I had been with for more than a decade, um, I went to HR, uh, senior leadership, and shared with them my concerns about the racism that I was experiencing there. And I was met with that. Now, both of you know me well enough where you've seen my- Met with like, why are you attacking me or? I was met with, okay. I was aggressive, hostile. That's, I don't, I, I, I don't show up like that. So it was similar to your experience Maya, is that because I didn't show up, what I probably didn't have because I was passionately talking about being discriminated against, what I, I probably didn't have was a smile on my face. And that was perceived and it was described as me being hostile and aggressive. Mm. And that is from my lens about me being a black woman. You know, and again, the direction of power within the context of our culture, the pattern often is if you're black and you express something is wrong, you better be able to prove it. So the particular senior leadership person, HR person that I talked to, they outright said, and I don't even think they knew how wrong it was. I don't believe that, Nasia. This is coming from HR and senior leadership. But think about this. Think about being burdened with being in a workplace. And I just attended a webinar today where over 50, they report that a study shows over 50% of, of Black people report racial discrimination in the workplace. Okay, but when we report it, people don't believe us? Where does that leave us? Where does that leave us? You, we work to live. So being in these environments and being subjected to this discrimination is tied into our survival. 
And that's what makes it so oppressive. And to me, that's why I'm so very passionate, Scott, and I've shared this with you about the work we do, because I know what it's like to have to show up day after day and not really be able to walk into and be who you truly are without contacting punitive consequences. Mm -hmm. True. Very, very, very true. I mean, and that definitely, I mean, I know I see it in my workplace all the time. Um, and to a degree, some of it has been normalized. Um, people think like, I know you, so I can say this. And it's like, that's such a stereotype. Why would you, you know, yeah. and I will call people like, you know, that's like, that's, that's very antiquated thinking you've got going right there. You know, I've, I've said that to people because we can actually have those conversations. I'm like, that's yes. not appropriate. Um, but you're right. It's just this, it's easy to assume like there's a person who works with my job who I know everybody sees her as an angry black woman because she tells you exactly what she thinks with no filter. Yeah. There was actually yeah. two, like, I know for sure, without a doubt, it, I'm like, why can't she just maybe be just an angry person? Because <laughs> there are other of us that work here who are not angry at all. You know what I mean? So, but you're right within the workplace that does frequently happen. There's a lack of understanding. I mean, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with people like to say to me, can you explain to me exactly what Black Lives Matters means? And I'm like, Okay, I think it's kind of straightforward, but yes. what people are hinged on is the black part. That's the part, yeah. that, that's the part that takes people off center with this. Um, they're like, well, why is it just black? Why can't it be all lives matter? I mean, because black lives matter is addressing a very specific issue that is unique to black people. I said, white people are black and brown people are being killed at a, a different rate number, interacted with law enforcement different than white people are. So hence, that's where it comes from. Yes. And they're like, oh, I'm like, but what it isn't saying is that your life doesn't matter. It's saying in this specific situation, this is what the issue is. Our lives matter. Yeah, Do you get it? Absolutely. It's not saying over the entire life experience that only black lives matter. And it was interesting how such a simple concept, which means it's been so diluted at this point that people don't get what it's about. Mm -hmm. And I had to have that conversation multiple times. So the organization I work for, we actually did a moment of silence when it was like warmer outside, you know, in support of Black Lives Matter. And I mean, it was interesting. A lot of associates and nurses and doctors came down to do it. But I thought it was important to the approach that the organization took was that they want to do better in being a resource or a conduit for black and brown people to have the access to healthcare they don't, to do more in educating their community. So they took us, here's where we can be powerful, but we also should take a moment to know that there is an issue here that we, we wanna say that we support. And I thought that piece was, yeah. it seemed at least remotely, you know, genuine, I suppose. Um, yes. Everyone yeah. who spoke to it seems like they really meant it. And, and you didn't, you weren't forced to come down. So, you know, people made a choice to come down to participate, but you have some people that just, refuse to get the nature of what it's saying. And I will tell you this flat out from being respectfully in my job in the emergency department, I have seen how black and brown people are treated entirely different oh, yeah. than people who are white being brought in by law enforcement. Seriously, oh, yes. huge difference. I was like, someone would tell me that this isn't real, but I know what I'm seeing. Yes, it's real, it's real. Let me, let me just go here for a minute because we only have a few more minutes left. I try, I'm trying to be in my life at this point in my life, very solution focused. And I think about what, what is the solution or can we get close to a solution? I have my thoughts and I can tell you what I appreciate to remedy deal with this, address it. Um, what are your thoughts, Scott and Maya, on how we can be change agents? Because this is traumatizing people. When you think about this stereotype and what it does and the damage it causes, Maya, you are a mental health professional. You can speak to the damage suppressing who you are causes over time. You know, hell, if you can't be angry anywhere, it's going to come out somewhere. But the problem is, the, you know, I would tell people to ask yourself a question. Why do you think people are so angry? What is there to be angry about? Where's the root of the anger? Where's the source of it? Where is it coming from? Why do you feel the stereotype exists? What, where does it come from? That's the first question you should ask. So if you have something that historically has traveled for decades with, with a group of people, you should ask yourself, there must be a reason for why they're angry. Yeah. And that's the case with, you know, if you see a person who seems balanced and happy, why are they happy? <laughs> What's going on? Right. What's, 
what's working for them? Because I want a piece of that too. You know, that's the question you should be asking is whatever is eliciting the emotion, whether it's positive or negative, you should want to know where it comes from. Everything has a source. So to me, until we start to have the conversation about, which we've never had, by the way, we've never had any real salient conversations in this country about anything. Everything gets a Band-Aid. Um, we, we do a couple things, maybe pass a couple laws, pass out some money, and we assume things get better. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't really work like that because if we're not changing people to understand what's happening and how you receive others, how you respect or treat others, then we're going to keep having the same problem when it's all said yes. and done. So do I think it's something that's fixable? Yes, but first you must make people, you know, the new term is woke. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, it's kind of like, you know, like if I'm a big fan of like, you know, sci-fi stuff. If you ever watch Dune, he talks about the sleeper has awakened. And that's the thing. We are a country that's not necessarily woke. We all of a sudden are a bit more aware that something yeah. has been right in front of our eyes the entire time yeah. about a lot of stuff. But to me, when I said when you're woke, it's like you are really dialed into what exactly is going on, which means it's going to be a whole lot of maybe not liking something that you learn about something in your history. It doesn't even mean it's necessarily you. Or maybe you have been a person that's guilty of treating people that way without even realizing because we've normalized such bad behavior <laughs> respectfully. Is. We've normalized a lot of things. Like I had a person in my job the other day comes over and goes, Maya, the song on the radio, she goes, what is, what is WAP mean? Because like, I know you'd know. And I looked at her and I said, why do you think I know? Because I happen to be black and two black women sing the song. And then she looked at me. I said, what happens if I don't know? Turns out I know, but that's not the point. <laughs> I wanted to let her know, but I've also known her since I was a kid because her yeah. family went to the same grade school. So yeah. I know why she came to me and approached me that way. But I also think, be careful because some people will get offended. Like, why do you think I know that? That's exactly. I agree with what you're saying. And let me offer this too. And Scott, I want to hear your thoughts too when I'm done. You know, one of the missing pieces that I see in all of this is people really, everybody reflecting back on their own behaviors, their own values, their own like lens and ways of seeing things. What changed for me as the world erupted several months ago around race is when I got woke to how my black behind was contributing to maintaining systemic racism. And mm -hmm. what I got real woke to Maya is how I bought into, let me maintain my middle-class lifestyle and, and keep these white folks, you know, comfortable and not say anything because if I open my mouth, what, what's going to happen? Yes, they are going to get angry and I'll probably lose my job. And that will mean, what will it mean? I'm woke to what it means now. It means I go get another job. But for a long time, I made that mean, oh, my life would be over. So I think my ask of people, and this is part of the work that Scott and I do, is really helping people get present to themselves. That's all of us reflecting back Mm -hmm. on yourself and taking time to do that. I think if we do more of that, that can start impacting changes we need to see around race. Because one of the things that I, I, I can say I have resented, when I bring things to people's attention, the obliviousness to like, oh, really, Nasia? Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, really? But there's just this lack of un this lack of awareness that I think there's some power in reflecting back on self, thinking about why we do some of the things we do. Because I see all this um, this wokeness, this sudden wokeness. But I also see <clears throat> that the same people who are going to march, the so-called allies in Black Lives Matter, you know, are the same people who won't stand with me. If somebody, if they see me be, being discriminated against on the job, who won't stand with me when somebody at their, in their family makes a racist joke. You know, it's real easy. It feels good to be out marching and protesting. But what I need is for people to reflect back on themselves close to home, not out there. 
I'm talking about right in here where mm -hmm. we're at first with the person in the mirror then the people in your environment you know reflect on where you're working at because it's so easy to other this other it mm -hmm. so careful. that that's my thought scott i'm curious to hear what you have to say god i have so many thoughts um one thing that is that i see is somehow we got to get people we got to get white people really um in touch with in kind of an experiential way of like what the cost of this is right because uh like you guys feel it uh and feel it pretty directly and i don't think we do you know um and and i expect it's there mm -hmm. right like um like just just the cost of bias racism um it, it just bias really mm -hmm. is uh and like you kind of said it like a fear of the other yeah uh has a huge cost right it's like you know like as long as i'm afraid of black people to some degree or another it limits where i can go in the world it limits my expression it like it and i might not see it you know what i'm saying like I might just get a little like like this a little tighter and not even be present to it but it's there right yes. and and I think probably like why why black lives matter is such a threat to to people is cuz we're in this kind of like um it occurs for us like tranquility but it's probably more like tranquilized mm. right um, but it's a threat to the, so, oh, that's good. Um, like it's a threat to the tranquility because it is like, just like, leave me alone. You know what I'm saying? Like, th like things are okay. I don't feel it too much. Um, if people got present to that, it's really not tranquility. It really is more like tranquilized and, and, and really legitimate and this goes well beyond the world of race like this is how people live their lives really is like it's more like sleepwalking through the days you know mm -hmm. and um and it's why people miss the good old days because they were kids and you know and then at some point they got tranquilized right mm -hmm. um so, so I think like waking people up to the cost of that. Now, see, that's kind of where in you and I, Nassie, have had this conversation before. It's kind of like, how do we get people to wake up to that, right? Like, how do we get people to wake up to that? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and I don't know that I have the answer there. Well, I, I kind of have some of the answers there because, you know, I do some of this work where I help people kind of like wake up to uh, maybe not their biases around race, but their biases, you know? and see how they're impacting them. Like my, my, what I'm really interested in is like, how do we get people interested in that? You know, cause there is something about the collapse between tranquility, like mistaking tranquility mm -hmm. when you're really tranquilized and people like being like, you know what? I think I'm cool being tranquilized. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they'd say it that way, but living that way, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the other thing I was going to say, well, I actually had wrote a, written a little note down here, but I think one thing, um, but then you just kind of untied that shoelace, I guess, was um, I was going to say, like, you got to get an ally, but like what you pointed to was that it's one thing to be an ally when it's kind of interesting, like, I want to go check out the protest, right? Yes. Versus like actually like putting your neck out there in the workplace mm -hmm. when me opening my mouth, yes. like could have my boss say, oh, well, you're the pro, you know, yeah. like that's really risking something. Like it's not real risking, not really risking anything to go to a protest. Yeah. But for me to say like, hey, uh, you, you know, I don't, I don't think, you know, uh, like you call Nasia aggressive and angry. You don't say that about yes. Veronica over there. And, uh, and she has no problem, like, you know, mm -hmm. and the difference I see is color, right? Um, yes. 
and 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 then that too i think again that kind of that circles back to what i was saying about like how do we get people interested in waking up because i think again it's easy to say like oh i'll go be an ally but it's like to put your neck out it's kind of like you, you got to get a little sick of the status quo mm -hmm. right and i don't think we're present to the what the status quo, quo costs us i don't think us white people are present to like how yeah. real the cost of the status quo is i think it's just so the water we swim in that yeah you know yeah i do i do Thank you both for that. And, and this is what I say. I just want to end this on allyship because we, we talk a lot about allies and I've gotten real clear in the last six months on who my allies are. Mm -hmm. I do not want these fair weather allies. If anybody is out there calling themselves my ally, understand, unless you are willing to share the burden, the inconvenience and the detriment, this oppression has caused me and people that look like me, stay where you're at. Because what you do is you contribute to the problem. My allies have to be in the thick of it with me. If you cannot put your mouth on me when you see somebody, and this is a conversation I had with the folks in my workplace. If you see somebody kicking my ass and you won't jump in and say, stop it, I don't need you. I'm too far along in the game for that, stay behind. So I, I welcome, there's some of us who say, I don't, I don't need an ally, I welcome allies, but be clear that just because you like my, my Facebook post does not make you my ally. Just because you are marching in Black Lives Matter does not make you my ally. Just because you view my YouTube videos, you are not my ally. You are my ally if you can share the burden of what all of this is. That's what I need. And that's, that is where I will end. Do you, do you have anything else to offer either of you? I think you're spot on with that. <laughs> okay. Uh, spot on. Well, listen, what I'm going to do, Maya will connect um, okay. and I'll make sure all of your information is linked to this video. This okay. was a good one. I think, um, did you want the recording too, Maya? Oh, absolutely. Yes. You can have the recording. I think I'm also going to post this on Z LLC and of course, Pivot to Inclusion. Um, I want to thank everybody who is watching. Continue to do the work, reflect, and be a real, not performative ally. Thank you so much from Pivot to Inclusion, and we will see you next time.